Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Enterprising Minds, where you get the three of us discussing interesting things in digital marketing, AI, and SEO. Um, we kind of got lost in our pre-show chatter uh, before we hit record, so I think we might end up just jumping right into what we were discussing. Um, I was showing, for a little bit of context, I was showing Ruthie and Alex some some really interesting um, AI summary tools from Writer. Uh, no affiliation as of this uh, recording. It's just me trying it out and seeing. And I was kind of shocked because it's taking a process uh, for this show that would have been up to two weeks of work, you know, as like side project time um, and distilling it down to 15 minutes, maybe. Right. Um, it's pretty impressive and pretty awesome. Um, so that's the context for the insights that uh, Alex, you were um, yeah. beginning to speak Super about. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so jumping straight into it, um, so Writer was, was being used to provide some transcription as well as pull some quotes from it. So it was able to take video, pre-recorded video, and then based pull that transcription information out. So we were able to take that, modify it, make it a blog post, do whatever we want with it. So I was the thing right now I'm kind of shocked by is that I'm not really seeing one solid kind of major brand come out and say that we are incorporating a whole kind of journey of tools. And what I mean by journey is kind of the marketer's journey. So Salesforce could come out with, with a tool saying that we have acquired rights to Canva for, for your imagery and your design and your templates. Uh, we've acquired access to Descript for transcription services and this other tool for podcast recording and quality you know, improvement. So now you can basically just hit record and our tool will take care of the next you know, five steps of pulling out a description, creating that transcription file for closed captioning, time stamping it, doing all that kind of stuff, uh, creating the logo, adding in that artwork that's required to have your intro, outro. I mean, you can have that kind of free done. There's so many elements to it that take effort, but these AI tools are piecemeal, taking this little bit and optimizing it, this little bit and automating it, this little bit and coming up with a better enhanced version of your current base version or this little bit and giving you 10 options for you to pick from. But there's not really a comprehensive element here that I've been seeing that kind of pulls in these different tools together, which is surprising considering how many of them are connecting, you know, API connections back to chat GPT or API connections back to here or there, but it's not really the reverse. And they're offering, okay, now you can get the API connection to Descript and pull in that tool set into your, and integrate it into your larger tool set. And then have something like a one-stop shop. I need to make a podcast. I hit record. It does the next five steps for me. Instead, I got to figure out and learn. Oh, I need this. Okay. Oh, what what do I need to do to you know pull a grab a quote from this so I can throw it on TikTok? Oh, I got to do this format and put it in this kind of resolution or this kind of scale. Like that, that's a lot of. There's a lot of these pieces, but I'm not really seeing a, something that adds it together. Have you have you guys come across anything like that? So I, the closest thing that I think is out there on the market, well, it'll be coming soon to the market, um, will be Microsoft's Copilot. And the the thing that makes me really excited about the, the, the Copilot piece, depending on who they make it available to, right? If they only make it available to the enterprise level, that's going to be a bummer. <laughs> um because the basically the value uh the value proposition of it is that it will take all of your meeting notes all of your word documents all of your powerpoints all of your excel things it'll be able to pull all of the data from all of your business activities that you would do within the office suite and then help you create what you need right so some of the stuff that it showed in the demo and i'll put a link in to the show notes to the their like first intro demo of what they're you know um attempting for it to do it would be like oh i'm about to jump into this meeting summarize the you know the document that was shared as part of the meeting invite 
so that you have a general thing. Or it can say, based on the transcript, here's what you missed when you logged in 10 minutes late. Um, or you can then go into Copilot and say, based on the meeting that I had or the notes that I took for the meeting um, that we did, create a PowerPoint based on the key takeaways. So now all of a sudden you have PowerPoint generation, you have um, data from your Excel sheets, you have your um, qualitative notes on uh, the meetings you would have on the, the data presentations and, and all that stuff being combined, which as we know, traditionally would take up a huge amount of time. I mean, just even building a deck, collecting all of the different data sources from all the different tools to your point that do one specific thing takes a huge amount of time, but now it'll be fairly well automated. But to your point of very specific tactical things, I think there's going to be, there's going to be market consolidation. I mean, that's just always what happens, right? You get the brand new thing. There's a huge explosion of people tackling a very particular niche. Um, and then the incumbents buy them. Right, like I could easily see Descript because of its, um, because of its video editing and audio editing capabilities with the transcription. If the companies don't just outright grab that functionality and build it in house, you know, they could easily buy Descript. Apple or Adobe with their video editing things could easily buy Descript and incorporate that into their tool stack. Um, or they just build it in house, right? I mean, that's that's the the problem with, you know, starting something, obviously. Um, but then, like Jasper's close, but again, it's like one of my frustrations with Jasper AI is that it's good at creating the text for very particular tactical things like YouTube title, YouTube description, blog generating ideas. Um, you know, that kind of stuff, but it it doesn't bring it in all together and the UI is off. Like it's not as nice um, as it could be. So those are some initial thoughts. Ruthie, what were you going to jump in with? I want to, I'm thinking about the question you asked itself and um, just that it's a question that we're asking so soon after the introduction of not the introduction, but the popularization and the expansion of, of right. large language models. And where my head goes is, you, you know, a decade ago, if when we were sort of all doing our SEO stuff, we never, never expected all the SEO tools to work together. In fact, it was like, mm, no, it was kind of better that they specialized. You kind of, you wanted Screaming Frog to do its own thing and you wanted Moz or SEMrush to do their own thing. And of course, we saw the evolution of those tools expanding and sort of trying on new capabilities until you have a SEMrush, say, that does all the things. And I, at least what I've always noticed with those sorts of expansions is they're still really good at what they were core at. And as they added functionality, it was sort of mediocre. Like in some cases they got better and they got good at it, but it was sort of like they tried to do all the things. Um, and we saw that evolution, but that was over the course of a decade. Here we are about a year out from some of the intros of chat GPT and everybody sort of getting on board and how quickly we expect all of these tools to work together. Like, that's just astonishing to me. It's like, what well, the, because I have the same expectation. Like, why isn't there a tool that does all the things? Like, why hasn't a Salesforce just adopted all the things? And at the same time, I know, well, A, that would be powerful. Somebody's going to do it soon and others will follow suit. Also, you try and integrate tools and maybe they have the same look and feel, but they're not always fully integrated. And so I always keep that in the back of my mind. Like, where do we want to use specialization and, and where do we want to just sort of use the tool that's good at what it's good at? Then, of course, Dave shows us stuff like app.writer.com. And I go, oh, like that's actually like the... It, the bringing together of a bunch of functionality is actually saving a lot of time and effort. So the value is there if you can get it right. Mm -hmm. So that's just kind of where my head goes. I haven't seen anyone, anyone do this yet either, but I think it's interesting how quickly we're, we're expecting it and how, how the evolution of tools, at, you know, working together is just speeding up, speeding up. Like the API connections are getting better and better mm -hmm. um, to the point where we just expect that they work together. 
Well, Ruthie, coming off of your comments, uh, <laughs> jumping in here, um, I kind of wonder how much of that is based upon just the kind of current state. So we're so used to having these large incumbents be it. So we go to Amazon for everything. We go to Netflix for everything. We go to these Google for everything. I mean, whatever their sector kind of is, and th that sector is always expanding. We just expect that they will have just this you know, astonishing amount of investment that they will pour into a particular area and they will start to take over that particular area or attempt to take it over. But I think you're absolutely right. And I was going back to, I was thinking about Copilot and Skype and how Microsoft kind of flubbed that. They Skype was doing really well. It was from a even stability standpoint of, you know, it being running and working and how much that failed after it was purchased and started to be integrated and how much it still is not the go-to tool that has the major competitors, um, which, of course, they've introduced like Microsoft Teams. I mean, there's other kind of things that they've done as well. But those core elements, I, I guess the other piece that I wonder about, not just from the income standpoint, is going back to like your SEMrush comment, the way that the company handles acquiring new businesses as well as you know expansion. They are putting 75% of their funding right back into their primary tool. And then the remaining 25% that they're throwing into their company gets split between five different projects. And those small little teams endeavor and try to basically replicate what an entire another company is doing. And they never get there, not surprisingly. I kind of wonder if that's just an aspect of how they're running their business. So instead, if Amazon were to buy, or let's say, going back to the SEO examples, let's say SEMrush acquires Screaming Frog. What if they let Screaming Frog run by itself and have that team continue on its purpose and its journey? Because obviously they're set on a purpose and journey of making the best crawling tool for SEOs out there. And SEMrush, their main goal is not that. It's I mean, this SEO platform, but a lot of it is really is keyword research and it kind of stays and sticks around keyword research. So, you know, maybe that's just a, a poor integration or poor kind of, you know, investment attempts to be competitive or to play in markets where they really shouldn't be versus, you know, basically handling those companies or handling those side projects correctly. Right. I think the, the immediate example that comes to mind along those veins is what HubSpot did with the hustle. Right. They realized the hustle was targeting an audience that they absolutely wanted to be in front of with their tool. So they took, I think it was something like 6% of their annual marketing budget. So not very much and bought the hustle. And then once they did, they just said, we like what you're doing. Just keep doing it. Like what a weird concept, right? You don't have to <laughs> screw everything over with your own brand, like, <laughs> but you can still get the, you know, you can still get the benefit of it because it's, you know, they have the the trust and the relationship with the um, with the audience you're trying to target. So now it's, you know, hustle brought to you by HubSpot or whatever it is. Um, you know, I think that's keeping your keeping your eye on the game versus. Like your ego play, which I've seen Correct. so often with rebrands. We could talk about Twitter going to X and how much of an ego play that is and how really dumb that is. But <laughs> <laughs> there's so many of those times where you see those companies buy and acquire another company, and it's not a moment of happiness for the users of that smaller company. It's usually a moment of sadness, and you're like, oh, crap, they're going to get screwed up. Like, they right. were so good. <laughs> Yep, <laughs> because yes. they get the downfall. Like the, that's a it's kind of a negative pattern to say as a user of saying like you know if Screaming Frog were to get acquired by just about anybody, I'd probably be shedding a tear and for Screaming Frog instead of saying oh good they will now have the investment to do the things they want to. Do you imagine all the Frogger memes that would happen if the frog got bought? <laughs> you know, it would be fun. Be, it would be fun for a while, but also very sad. Um, yeah. So uh, if anybody from Screaming Frog ever hears this, we would love to chalk. It would be great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll take a little frog. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, so I the, the other thing that jumped out of my mind as uh, Ruthie was talking 
was just the insanity of, you know, not just the speed at which our expectations are happening, where why isn't all of this integrated, but also from what we spoke about in a, in a previous episode, the fact that we are still in the early adoption phase, right? Mm-hmm. Like the Pew research saying that only like 14% of people have even played with chat GPT. Um, you know, there's a tiny percentage of people in the workforce that are actually seeing any kind of benefit or even playing with AI at this level. And we already have these expectations, right? So it's kind of nuts to see as this grows, as this expands, what will happen and how everything will tie together. Um, there's, I think it was the Marketing AI Institute. They did a, a recap in one of their podcasts um, of their events. And they have this phrase that hit me Um Where it's just like, yeah, remember, this is the dumbest AI that we will be dealing with. And it's already super impressive. You know, (laughs) you know, on the one hand, you can be like, oh, shit. (laughs) But on the other, it's kind of cool. It is kind of cool. It's scary, but it's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think part of that too is just the fragmentation. There are so many AI tools being launched per week yeah. that you hope for somebody to pull it all together because then it'd just be easier to handle it. Just from like a mental load standpoint to also trying to figure out where does this fit inside my workflow? It's really, really hard to say this particular transcription tool is the one for me and I'm going to sign up for a two-year license or something like that. I don't want to do that right now with any of the AI tools. I will sign up for a trial and if it's free, I'll play around with it. And that's about as long as I'm going to get with it because I know next week there's going to be yet another transcription tool out there. And mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe it's better. It's it's still really hard to figure that out. It's just such a, everything is a new company. There's not really reviews of anybody. You know, there's not really a good way to, to sort through it and know that this is the one. Mm-hmm. Honestly, it'd be tough from a business proposal standpoint too. If I was trying to put together a business proposal, I would ask for you know, X amount of budget towards AI transcription tools and then just kind of leave that open and just start working through different ones. And as it changes, it changes. Instead of saying, I want to do this with this particular tool set. No, it's like you need a, you don't want to sign a contract because to your point, there might be the the next one that comes later. And that, that I think is a, that makes me, there's a there's another point with that, which is AI is coming quite quickly in terms of tool adoption and people creating all the all kinds of new new ways of using AI in different ways as your virtual assistant and as helping you with content and, and so forth. Enterprise moves slow. Mm-hmm. Enterprise moves very yeah. slow. And so I, the adoption curve, um, looks very looks very different if you are an enterprise versus if you are a small business or an individual. Mm-hmm. And this, you know, we've always compared um, enterprise companies to sort of like an armada in terms of like you you it takes a long time to shift the whole armada, whereas you've got startups that can move around them very quickly. That's sort of their advantage, even if they don't have the big budgets. And I wonder if this advent of AI just increases that gap, where all of a sudden you, you've got the small startups who can both move quickly, but with AI they also have access to way more resources than they would have otherwise. And you've got the armadas that are still extremely hard to move, right? It's really hard to move a Fortune 500 company. There's just a lot of people. There's a lot of um, processes in place to enable that many people. And it's going to take it a little bit longer for the Fortune 500s to be able to utilize AI in the same way. And I'm curious to see, like, do you have a bunch of drop-offs in the Fortune 500s? Like, do they just, can they just not compete? Do you, like, do you amplify that effect where startups are just eating the Fortune 500? Or maybe you have that for a little bit until the Fortune 500s and 100s can catch up and all of a sudden they're using AI and all of a sudden they become much more powerful. And so you sort of have a shifting landscape over the next few years um, as as the speed of adoption um, is different across different companies and individuals versus large enterprises. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a huge area to explore. Yeah. I would definitely bet the latter. I'm just thinking of the AI tools that I've been seeing and yes, I'm a marketer. So I 
probably more aware of those particular tool set. But that's what I'm seeing is it's because of large language models of what they're good at and diffusion models of what they're good at. So we have text, we have um, we're starting to get like with code interpreter from uh, open AI, we're starting to get kind of more towards the programming side of things, but really we're still kind of on that side of things. We're not at the logistics contracts and kind of back inside of the business piece, which I think of those large fortune 500s, that's they're in multi-year contracts with governments. They're in large shipping orders from, you know, X country to the X country and manufacturing X product with a life cycle of 10 plus years. I mean, they, they've, that's on such a different scale in the back end mm -hmm. where they have waged that war and won in such large sums that they can sit on that for some time. And these startups won't be able to somehow kind of narrowly kind of come in and start eating away at significant portions of that. It would take them time, just like I knew it would take anybody else to kind of rise up the ranks to try to tear down some of those companies. That being said, I'm thinking of that in definitely like a product related, material product related world. If you switch that to tech, that could be really different. I mean, if we could get really great, totally AI created video content, could I create my own Netflix? Maybe. I mean, there's like a huge anime crowd. I'm not in it, but I know that there's a huge crowd there. There's a lot of money behind it. There are particular um, kind of video on demand services that cater directly to that audience and take from you know those comics and the recordings and everything that's related to that and try to roll that up into a monthly fees. Could you create something else straight from AI and, and basically recreate something like that? Could I do a sci-fi movie? better than, I, than Netflix could, or maybe cheaper without their operate overhead and operating costs. Like maybe there's some elements there that you can kind of sneak in with more of a, a tech-based company. But when I think product-based, then I th definitely think the latter situation. Well, and the difference too is when you're smaller, you're on the offense, right? So getting, you want to grow, you want, you need to build that library of intellectual property, whereas the incumbents, right, they're defensive. So yeah, they're taking a longer time with AI because you don't want, you know, like the Samsung example, right? You don't want to be the first company to accidentally submit proprietary information and then discover that everybody can see it, right? Um, you have to be careful with what you're developing so that you can maintain your, your intellectual property, right? Um, you have more to lose when you already have, you know, the, the sandcastle <laughs> and the moat around it. And, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. And Does that, that really moat, happen with Samsung? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a few companies that There's a product There's development. Product There's, development. Information. There's a product development thing. And they grabbed onto AI and lo and behold, it became part of the model. And so now, yeah. Little side, speaking of kind of like news around AI, and that was kind of a, an earlier one, but there's one where we're more recently talking about ChatGPT getting dumber. Maybe mm. you guys seen any of the articles on that. Um, there's been a series of tests and it's, being worse, basically, at them. Um, I just wanted to pull that out because I was playing around with it yesterday and was trying a site that's kind of a programmatic SEO-based test site that basically I've been creating. And I asked, asked it for trivia on a particular topic and then asked it for responses around 750 words. And this was the reply from it. I apologize for the misunderstanding, but providing 750 word responses each piece of trivia will result in excessively lengthy and practical conversation. Additionally, generating such lengthy responses for trivia would not be the most efficient use of this platform. I.e., they don't have the server what? space. <laughs> right? <laughs> I was like, you robots, give me my content. <laughs> that is not effective use of my time. 
<laughs> it's not a lengthy and a practical conversation. I'm like, this is also not a conversation. Um, <laughs> so is that the robot telling wow. you that you're just the the annoying know-it-all at trivia night then? You know? <laughs> this guy won't I shut up about the because... British wars. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the particular topic that it was on are things that each trivia point has its own Wikipedia page already out there, and I know that. Um, so there's a lot of content behind each one of these, and that's what I was hoping it to basically rephrase it and create that kind of content was basically to rephrase the kind of background story between this particular topic. But I, I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, hmm. straight up refused. Straight up refused. Okay. But like, I bet if you paid it, convoluted wouldn't. explanation for why you've been refused, not just a like nothing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I know. I would be very interested as a test. Take what is it, eight dollars, twenty dollars for a month, um, for plus, and retry the thing after you after you get the premium. Yeah, I do have the premium version. This was uh, three point five that I was playing around with, so I could try GPT four um, with the same topic and see if it would generated i have noticed quite a bit of differences now between 3.5 and 4 of quality length some other elements like that so that'd be that'd be a worthwhile test but i am i don't know we've talked about this before and i'm still kind of stuck with this question i mentioned kind of the pre-show discussion i in this last week i've just been mulling over it, especially with projects like this is this just are we just filling the world with content is it going to be of quality? Is that just, you know, maybe it's a rising tide sort of thing of the quality of content out there on the internet will now just be a little bit better. Um, maybe there'll be less weird spelling mistakes and stuff on forums because there'll be tools that would say, hey, let's rewrite this a little bit more concise instead of your rambling diatribe on this topic. You know, here's a short response to this forum poster. You know, maybe, maybe there'll be like, you know, tool integrations and that sort of thing across the board, not just from blogs and programmatic SEO, but I don't know if it's going to improve things or to Dave, will it just erode the moat and content will no longer be a moat? Well, so, you know, in my, my previous comments about whether or not AI is a steroid and are we just reliving the steroid scandal of, you know, the nineties baseball, um, the context for that, because I've been continuing to think about it, especially with all these other conversations we've had um, on how things have developed and how people are actually using it and, and all that. Um, when you looked at what happened with music, uh, <laughs> um, if you if you look at what happened to the music industry during the, the 2000s, you had a number of things, right? You had Napster that was eating away um, at any of the record sales or the, the streaming or whatever else you had, but you also had the quality and the pricing for the equipment that you would create your music with plummeted you know so the quality skyrocketed and the, and the price plummeted so now all of a sudden you didn't have to pay three hundred dollars an hour to record your record you could just grab a cup of coffee and sit down in your own house and get pretty really good demo quality you know records out of it the people who were able to take it to the next level knew how to mix properly knew how to you know do the audio engineering you know bring it to that next level so then you had Bandcamp, YouTube, TikTok, all that stuff flood with people who could now create their music and get that out into the world. But you still have the problem of garnering the attention for the work that you're doing, mm -hmm. getting enough people to see it and like it, to engage with it and mm -hmm. support you as an artist. So... You know, my statement around this will just be kind of steroids for what it is you are good at, I think rings true in the sense that if you decide to go 
the thought leadership route and create the content towards a particular aim, or you need help getting your novel idea out and doing self-publishing on Amazon and all that stuff. Um, that's great. Use it, do it. Right. But you still have the problems of getting enough people to notice what it is you're doing to tell their, you know, it has to be a high enough quality for them to tell their friends about it. Right. Or tell it, you know, are, are you going to tell your mom about the book you read or is it, you know, some crazy fan fiction you can't talk about in public. Right. <laughs> Um, there, there's a lot of those factors and especially in the attention economy, now that everybody can just grab their phone and jump on TikTok and talk about something, you know, for a while or, um, you know, piece things together with the, the AI transcription into all the stuff. Like we will have a flood of content, but is it resonant enough with enough people for it to become viable? That question still remains. Ruthie, what are your thoughts? As you're talking, Dave, it occurred to me to, so a couple of thoughts that occurred to me. One is, um, I mean, AI is just a giant shift in the supply of content, right? So I think you're just like, we're just going to have a lot more content at a lot lower price point. Um, which is curious because a lot of the content that we consume is already free, right? In a sense. So uh, one of the amazing things about the internet was just how willing people were to create content and share it for free on the internet, right? Setting ads aside, just like sharing fan fiction on, on various websites, sharing, um, you know, I remember deviant art, just artists putting stuff out and just creating things and getting excited. Like there was the ability to sell, but also people were just excited about creating and sharing. And amazingly, there was a bunch of people excited about reading and viewing all the content. Um, so maybe we just have like a massive proliferation of just more, more content produced cheaper and people just get to get more niche in terms of, I get to consume as much content in the specific area that I'm excited about. So that's one way I sort of see this playing out and sort of the diminishment of the moat. I think I just made up the word diminishment. Um, the other thought that occurred to me is Dave has for years sort of sent different music articles. Um, and one of the things I discovered, maybe this was from Dave, maybe this was um, from a Louis Vuitton show, was the impact of sampling in the hip hop world. Yeah. So you all of a sudden can take a drum beat from something that was recorded, you know, 60 years ago, repeat it over and over and over. And now you do not need backup musicians. And now you can do cool things with a completely new genre of music that is, that is hip hop and electronic to some degree. And so maybe that's another route this goes. Maybe the advent of AI just creates new genres of content and content consumption on the internet that we just haven't seen before. And it's not so much that it's a drastic shift um, of, of the current content that we have now. We just have a completely new set of it that's, that's out there. Um, that's these are some <laughs> very new ideas that are starting to take shape in my mind. I was seeing my grandfather who's 93 years old and later my kid was playing with this toy. That's a, it's a DJ toy. And I was thinking about like, how would I explain to him that I've paid to go to concerts to see one individual stand before a crowd in front of a small little mixer device and fiddle with the knobs and thought that that was an amazing experience and versus yeah. the bands of his day, which I'm sure were far more than that and live music versus pre-recorded music and all the rest of that and how would i explain that to him and i was thinking guy i don't know if i can uh, mm -hmm. that's just such a going to be such a different experience but that's a really good point ruthie of also this is a new type of content this was a new wave of content and it's not to say that there isn't live music being played anymore it still is this is now just another kind of avenue and a, a new way of doing that well i think my dad it lived in Denmark for a while in the seventies. And he has this story of sitting in a bar, trying to explain what a marshmallow was <laughs> because how do you do that? If you have no concept of it, it's 
like it's a sugar pillow that we eat. <laughs> it's a it'd be crunchy. It's soft. A soft sugar pillow. Exactly. Like, you know, and how do you do it in a way where it's like, yes, I would like to eat this, you know, but given the context of having, you know, not previously seen one, not previously eaten anything like right. it, you know, uh, it's just, it's kind of hard to, you know, to do that. Now, of course, you have, you know, marshmallow fluff and, and goop and gels and whatever else they sell marshmallows. I personally don't like marshmallows um you know but it's it's kind of everywhere right everybody kind of knows what a marshmallow is um you know same thing with popcorn he would describe popcorn to them and they're like we feed corn to the pigs why would you eat that right <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so things will adapt over time but um i think context is is everything um, and we might not be able to predict a lot of what is coming because it's just it's like a marshmallow to us like it doesn't exist today and we can't even imagine it or at least the majority of people can't imagine it and it's the, you know people will create new variations and they'll iterate and they'll try new things and then through that course of iteration and trying new things we'll have the evolution of of content and the way we interact and it might not even be content like that's that's another piece of it you know ai might can we might be doing new things with ai that just we don't do today i guess is the gist of it mm -hmm. hmm. yeah. well this was an interesting discussion um uh, kind of an impromptu one but it is a nice summary of kind of all the things that we've been talking about and and reading and you know as we've developed down this um journey of a brand new tool um and how it's going to change the world um there were some other things that i was going to bring up in our normal show format but you know maybe we'll do that uh we'll do that later um or i'll do a one-off We'll see. We'll see what happens. But thank you all for listening. Like, subscribe, share. Um, you know, find us on LinkedIn uh, threads if you're on threads, you know, whatever platform. Um, and let us know. We love the feedback. We love the comments. Appreciate it. And we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers. <laughs>